Okay, so this is the uh, next evolution, if you will, of the uh, CTVI access control, Atrium access control. Uh, this is a, a new uh, platform. And the whole idea behind this uh, new product, among other things, uh, I think the major onus is to be able to uh, provide a solution to uh, customers that are uh, more and more getting uh, faced with a situation of uh, card cloning happening. So um, the uh, famous 125 kilohertz um, Wiegand readers that we're all familiar and comfortable with um, over the past two or three years, we're seeing more and more uh, become more and more frequent, if you will, um, people being able to uh, clone their, their access cards and make copies of them. As a matter of fact, you can Google like anything else, you can Google and find products uh, very easily on the interweb to be able to uh, copy cards. So um, this is not a good thing if you're trying to secure your building and restrict who has access to what areas and so on and so forth. So uh, a big issue for many um, uh, end users out there. So this crypto uh, platform, if you will, um, ecosystem provides a solution that will prevent card cloning and uh, not have to reinvent the entire wheel of how we do access control. So uh, keeping things simple is a, uh, once again, uh, one of our uh, top priorities uh, to CDVI um, when we uh, create products. And uh, this crypto is another one in that line uh, and thought process, if you will. So uh, the crypto uh, high security solution, uh, what is it? So it's the, it's a new panel. Uh, as far as the footprint and the size of the board, uh, if you're familiar with the CDVI product, the Atrium product, the A22 control panel, it is the exact same footprint that we have uh, existing for the A22 with this new panel, A22. So same size, same boxes. Uh, if you're, um, we do have a partnered up with uh, Altronics to be able to provide a uh, multiple uh, a housing for multiple controllers in one single housing. So if you've done it before with the A22s, you'll be able to do the same thing with these A22Ks. Uh, so what is the difference between the A22 and the A22K? As we're seeing on screen here, some of the uh, highlights, I think the first point is one of the biggest ones. Uh, the A22K uh, is a two-door, four-reader controller. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, you can actually put two readers on the same reader port to be able to accommodate a read in, read out uh, in the uh, previous um, boards that we had available, including the A22, the predecessor, uh, which is still available by the way. Um, we're not eliminating the, uh, the A22, it's just that we're offering a new uh, um, solution to provide for these, uh, any um, issues that an end user might have with cloning cards. So this is a solution for that. Um, so this two door four reader uh, controller allows us to put two readers on the same reader port and uh, through a very simple uh, wiring connection, field wiring, you'll be able to identify which reader is the in reader, the entry reader, and which reader is the exit reader. And I'll be showing you that a little further in the uh, presentation here. So um, another plus, you don't need to have two reader ports to do reader in, reader out, uh, contrary to older uh, um, products that we had available. Um, now you can put two readers on the same port. Uh, one of the reasons why that is is because the connection between the actual reader and the reader port on the panel. And the reader ports, uh, just to highlight here, uh, located right where my mouse is hovering right now, the top, um, excuse me, the bottom two left uh, hand side terminals, the, be the black one and the beige one, black one being door one, and the, the beige one being door two on the system. So now each of these reader ports, you will be able to accommodate two readers. So you'll be able to put two readers in parallel. parallel and I'll show you exactly how that's done. Um, so the connection between the actual readers and the port is an RS-45 bus instead of a Wiegand protocol. Um, so um, gives you a lot more uh, uh, distance. So for RS-45, you can have the panel, the reader up to 4,000 feet away from the control panel. Uh, and another advantage is it's a four conductor, so you're going to be using some CAT5 or CAT6. Now, with previous, uh, with the A22 panel, um, the previous edition, predecessor of the A22K, uh, you could use CAT5 or CAT6. However, you'd be limited to 150 feet from the reader back to the panel. 
now with the same type of cable, which is a very economical cable, very common cable, network cable type of stuff, uh, you now have uh, a much higher uh, range from the reader back to the board. Um, we've also uh, enabled, if you will, HTTPS. So uh, the uh, Atrium product uh, has a web server on board, so you can connect to the system to any web-enabled device, smartphone, tablet, uh, computer, whether it's Firefox, Google Chrome, uh, that kind of stuff. So when you are using the web interface, um, you will now be able to see a secure connection. So there is a uh, certificate uh, that we use to be able to uh, ensure that the connection between the browser device and the actual control panel is uh, totally secured from end to end. So that's a big aspect. And that's a connection, it's an SSL connection. Basically what we're doing is, uh, it's been a couple of years now, when you navigate on the web, uh, the websites have, if you look at your address bar, HTTPS, um, that's the uh, HTTP secure. So um, that's used for uh, transactions, online transactions, so on and so forth. So we have that same kind of security behind the connection between your device, your smartphone, and the actual uh, system itself. So in increasing the security, enhancing security aspect is what this is uh, al allowing us to do. Um, for the guys that are installing out there, the, the, the field technicians, uh, I think this is a big uh, point for them. Uh, very simple, very easy, and thanks for the feedback from the guys. Um, the actual RJ45 port, the network port, where you uh, connect your patch cable of the board into the network, Instead of being uh, located off to the uh, pointing to the left, it's now pointing face out, as we see on this uh, image capture here. Uh, so you just push the uh, network cable into the port instead of having to uh, trying to find the uh, the port when it's off onto the side. So a nice improvement for what it's worth. Hey, you know, make it easy, make it simple. Uh, I'm all for that. Um, there's also, uh, just beside the uh, RJ45 port, the network connection, you, uh, just off to the right, uh, you'll see now that's new. This is a USB port. Uh, the hardware is uh, in, on the board, as we can see. Uh, it's just a matter at this point in time uh, to be able to, uh, for us as a manufacturer, to activate different features that we want to use for that uh, feature, such as we see here, uh, database backups. So if you are connecting to the system uh, through a um, enabled device you make some modifications um, what I want to save these modifications I don't have the atrium software I'm not at my computer whatever the case may be I want to be able I've connected to the system for example add a card created a schedule that kind of stuff and I want to save that to make sure that um, I don't have to redo it again if ever system uh, failure on disaster recovery while that USB port uh, will probably be activated to be able to do database backups other ideas that are um, bouncing around in our heads uh, at the R&D as uh, assigning pictures to users. So if we want uh, uh, certain applications, uh, especially in uh, membership scenarios, uh, gym fitness centers, uh, uh, shooting ranges, uh, community centers, and so on and so forth, wherever there's a membership scenario, golf courses and that stuff, uh, what uh, a lot of the administrators of these, um, these types of uh, solutions, if you will, um, they want to be able to pop up a picture of the user of the card that when we issued the, the card to. So when we issue a card, we take your take a snapshot, take a picture of you. And whenever you use your card to be able to pop up that picture on the screen by monitoring the system to be able to identify that the person that we actually gave the card to, I can see his picture, it's the actual person that's walking through that door. So for um, monitoring to make sure that people don't uh, uh, buy one membership and have uh, multiple people using that same membership. So uh, showing up a picture on an access event. Uh, video clips, we do some uh, some basic uh, video integration with Atrium. Uh, as we move forward, uh, we're gonna expand on that. Uh, one of the things, if we are going to be able to, um, for example, on alarm conditions on incidents within the system, we can use that as a trigger element to be able to create a little uh, snapshot, if you will, uh, of the uh, the actual incident, uh, forced door, access denied types of, type situations, uh, inputs and alarms, if you're monitoring uh, external devices, all of these options, if you want, you'll be able to use these to trigger 
a camera to record a 30 second video to see what was happening at the time, that kind of stuff. So this USB port would give us some of that memory capacity to be able to store these, uh, these short video clips onto a, a, uh, the USB device itself instead of having to refer back to a NVR or VMS system and so on and so forth. So it'll give you an additional option. So these are this certain things that were um, bouncing around in the office. If you have any suggestions, uh, by all means, uh, you can contact us. Uh, if you don't have our contact information, cdvi.ca is our website. The contact us page, you have everyone from the president right on through to our support department. Um, you'll have their contact information, reach out to Western Beaver. Um, it's thanks to your feedback that we've been building on this product and we, uh, we appreciate all the feedback that you guys send us. Um, so the USB port, um, we'll be adding that to features in the system and so on and so forth. Um, last bullet point on this screen here, IPv6. Uh, for those that are not too network uh, savvy, which I'm included in that, I have a, a good wherewithal, but am I a network administrator? No. However, uh, what we, um, the IPv6 is, uh, what that refers to is to the amount of uh, letters and or numbers, digits that you can assign for an IP address to something that connects to the network, whether it's the internet or your local network. Right now, I think everybody's become familiar with uh, the local addresses that would be issued on most local area networks, 192.168.1.1, for example. Um, now, that... 192.168.1.1, that is IPv4. So it gives you a vast amount of different IP addresses that you can issue. However, it's not infinite. So um, what's what's been happening in the last year or two, especially, is uh, the Internet of Things, the IoT. There are many uh, multitudes of different devices that are becoming Internet capable. You can wire, you can, uh, they're Wi-Fi capable, you can remote into your system and that kind of stuff. So there are millions and billions of devices that have access to the internet to be able to monitor uh, what's going on at home, uh, just thinking about uh, uh, cameras and so on and so forth. So because of all of these devices that are network capable, the amount of IP addresses, the 192.168 and all that has become uh, to a point where there won't be enough addresses for all the devices that exist out there. So this IPv6 uh, expands on the capability of the addresses and the, the types of addresses that you have. Um, I don't know exactly the uh, percentage amount, or you know, um, it, it could be tenfold, a hundredfold. So the IPv6 will allow to have billions and billions of additional devices that are going to be connecting to the system and be able to attribute each of them their own network address, which is required. So the A22K is now. Uh, is able to um, read and understand IP6, IPv6 uh, IP addresses. So uh, future-proofing the system, basically, is uh, what this allows us to do. Uh, as far as um, database capability, uh, the uh, card database in the system remains the same as what we had previously. It's at 10,000 users, 10,000 cards. Uh, we, you know, all the feedback we do get, one of the, you know, the lack of feedback, if you will, for a lack of a better term here, uh, no one has come back to us and said, well, 10,000 users is not enough and they need way more and this and that. So uh, we do not uh, uh, um, tax our uh, onboard memory to be able to increase the number of uh, users in the database when there's no requirement, we wanted to use this for other features. So save the memory for other applications that we, we might want to put forward in the future. So uh, the database of the users remains the same. Uh, something that has changed is the uh, keypad code length. Uh, up until today, up until the crypto solution, um, when you use keypads in the Atrium system, you needed to have a five pin, um, five digit pin code. Uh, and that was fixed. You had to use one, two, three, four, five, anything from there to nine, 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 uh, and so on and so forth. Um, now, through your feedback, uh, some people tend to prefer, end users tend to prefer a four digit code, a five digit code, a seven digit code. So you can now choose how many digits you want for your codes, uh, your pin codes. And the second bullet point, I think, is a, a nice option, a nice twist to this. Uh, 
not only can you have uh, different, um, if you set, for example, my system, people, or we got keypads, we want to use six digit PIN numbers. Uh, okay, so my system, I'll go into the uh, my interface and set it to six digits. So everybody that has a uh, PIN code will need to um, put in a six digit PIN. The 1130 goes to one. And okay, then hold on here. I'll just mute everybody. Thank you. That's what the feedback I was telling about. Okay, so that was easily solved. Uh, so the variable code length, uh, continuing on here, allows me to say with the system to say pin numbers will be accepted in the system uh, anywhere from five to eight digits. So some people might want a five digit pin number, other people might want an eight digit, uh, eight digit pin number. All of these will work on the same system. Uh, when you are using the variable code length, you will need to press either the, uh, the pound sign or the uh, asterisk, the, the, amper, the asterisk sign to confirm to the system that you've finished entering your pin code. So for example, if I set my system to a five digit pin code and I start entering my pin code out a keypad after the fifth digit the system knows that the the, the pin code has been completed because it's set to five digits so it'll automatically decipher and uh, grant access or deny access accordingly with the variable code length the system doesn't know that for you particularly as a user how many digits is your pin code so to be able to indicate to the control panel that i finished entering my pin number i simply push the pound key or the uh, ampersand, not the ampersand, I got ampersand in my mind, the uh, asterisk key to be able to indicate to the system my code is now entered, send type thing. Okay, so that's a nice little feature that will uh, uh, be able to accommodate some of the end user needs where we don't want everybody to have a five digit code or a six digit code. We want to be able to choose accordingly. Uh, last but not least on this page here, um, the firmware update process. Um, and this is a big gay for me as a uh, trainer, as a technician, um, and I'm sure that the guys that are installing this stuff. Um, in previous editions of the uh, Atrium product, whether it was the A22 or even the um, the legacy AC22s or AX22s, um, when you wanted to update the firmware on the system to uh, adhere to a new feature that we've brought forward and uh, or to fix an issue that you're experiencing with the system, um, you had two files to upload for each control panel. You had a CUF firmware file, and then you had to upload a PCK firmware file. They work together. So basically what we've done, uh, many people would not know this, and it's not common to have two firmware files. So uh, we put our, uh, our masters and genies together uh, back at the office and said, let's put these two firmware files into one single file. So it makes it much easier, much uh, less complicated for the installers, technicians to update the panel. So uh, a big yay for that on my end of things at least. So um, so when you are doing updates, uh, you will only now have to upload one file into your panel to, do, to complete the update process. Uh, the readers themselves, so it is a, um, if you will, it's a bit like of an ecosystem uh, for lack of a more creative term here. The A22K panel works with the K1 reader. And this is a, uh, a an ecosystem work together. So they do work uh, uh, hand in hand. So the reader itself, it's a smart card reader. It's not a Wiegand reader. It's a 13.56 uh, uh, kilohertz. Uh, instead of uh, 120 uh, megahertz instead of 125 megahertz uh, kilohertz so uh, they read the readers read the my fair classic desfire ev1 and ev2 credentials the they're compatible with all of these uh, different models if you will of uh, types of cards uh, they're all under the my fair umbrella my fair technology um, the ones that are the most recently uh, are as you probably already know is the desfire ev2 and these are the ones that when you will be purchasing uh, the uh, access cards for this product from us, uh, you'll be receiving the Desfire EV2 cards, that's the cards that we'll be using. However, the reader, as we see, can read older um, uh, MyFair type cards, as we see the EV1 and the MyFair Classic cards. So uh, a bit of uh, multi-technology capability there. 
Uh, on the uh, board itself, uh, in addition to the MyFair capability, uh, the second bullet point, uh, OSDP uh, slash two, so the, the second uh, revision of OSDP. And also we have on the board itself the, the PCB of the actual reader, uh, a little NFC ship that will allow us to, in the future, be able to accommodate mobile credentials. So OSDP uh, uh, for supervised uh, device protocol and uh, NFC for mobile credentials. At this point in time today, these options are not activated, uh, a bit like the USB port I was building, telling you a bit before. We bought the product to market so that it can have access to it. And through uh, firmware upgrades and so on and so forth, as time goes on, we'll be able to activate these different features uh, and these different um, hardware components on the boards themselves, whether it's the reader control, uh, the reader PCB or the A22K. So, of course, uh, being uh, a smart card reader, RS-45, um, that allows us to communicate and uh, talk, if you will, with the, uh, with the reader itself. So to activate the OSDP and NFC, uh, one of the things that when we do get into that uh, at that point, um, you'll probably find uh, on our website a upgradable firmware for your readers if you need to have these options activated in your particular system. And by the way, um, if you're not already aware of this, I think this distincts, uh, This is one of the things that distinguishes us with uh, several of our competitors. You can update your system uh, by logging into our website, going to the download center, and you'll have these firmwares available. Uh, if, you, if you haven't done it before, uh, there is no charge for upgrading your system. If you purchase the product, you can, over time, uh, if you need to correct issues or you need new features, you can go to our download center. If the uh, the latest uh, firmware allows um, the feature that you're looking for or corrects the issue that you're dealing with, you can download those firmwares into your product and be able to upgrade your system at no extra charge. Okay, uh, so that's another uh, plus for the uh, the uh, the Atrium product line and the CDVI products for that matter. Uh, last but not least. Um, the, uh, there is a, an accelerometer in the reader, so if uh, someone tries to uh, dismount the reader from the wall and put a uh, device behind the reader to be able to capture the, the card numbers and all that, well, as soon as you move this reader at all, uh, the, there will be an alarm generated in the system. You could react to that alarm like any other alarm in the system, sending emails, triggering relays, uh, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, this does provide supervision of the actual readers to make sure that they're not being uh, um, uh, vandalized, and among other things. Uh, this option, this tamper-proof, uh, you'll find in the uh, software menus for your readers, and it's an option that you enable. By default, we don't enable this, because when we install the product, we don't, don't want to generate a whole bunch of alarms while the installation process is taken into, a, into effect, so we haven't activated the accelerometer option by default. Once the system is installed, if you want to uh, supervise your devices, stop uh, vandalism, that kind of stuff, people from fiddling with the readers, you simply go into the reader menu for those particular readers and activate the alarm option. And that will be uh, allow you to supervise your readers 24 seven by default uh, with this option enabled. By default, the option is not enabled. Um, so the connection back from the reader, uh, just to reiterate and uh, re rephrase, um, the RS-45, so from the reader, a Category 5 type cable, CAT6, a network type cable, back to the control panel itself, and you'll be connecting the, uh, the K1 readers onto the points that we see here. So here's your data carrying cables, and then, of course, you have your power. And here we see this blue wire, and this is uh, refers to my... Uh, what I was indicating in the first uh, slide here, where we have entry and exit readers. So if you want to have uh, read in, read out on uh, on your door, you can put two readers, uh, of course, physically, one on the outside, one on the inside of the door. The one that's the on the inside of the door, your exit reader, you'll wire back to the control panel, and you will also include to identify the exit reader on your door, you'll simply connect the blue wire coming out of the back of that door, of uh, that reader, and connect it to the ground terminal. And this will allow the uh, control panel to identify that reader as the exit reader on the same reader port. So uh, very simple, very easy. You want to do in and out? Yep, not a problem. 
when you connect your two readers, the one that's on the, uh, the exit reader, you simply uh, connect the blue wire to the ground terminal on your control panel and your system is up and ready to go with your read in, read out. Uh, so if you've uh, delved into any of this, um, the issues where end users are having problems with cards being cloned and so on and so forth, there are other products in the market, of course, that uh, address this and uh, fine products. Uh, however, um, what we've done is to be able to have the same type of solution, if you will, uh, to prevent card cloning. Um, we've provided an easy solution where the alternatives, the uh, competition, if you will, you do need to have a, uh, a, a software that you will install on your computer and then use that software to program all your encryption capabilities. Uh, and these are options that you implement yourself and you have to go through all these different menus. And if you're not familiar with it, it can be very overwhelming. Uh, it can be tedious. It can be very difficult to uh, maintain. Uh, for example, I'll give you a scenario. Um, if I have a, um, a, a anti-cloning type reader and card installed, that's not the CDVI. Uh, and one of the readers happens to be defective. So in this particular building, I've got this alternative solution from CDVI that has that and has a solution for preventing card cloning. Uh, you need to, on each individual reader in the system, you have a what is termed a, a reader configuration card. So through that uh, software that you installed, you will be programming your encryption keys into that card. And that will allow you to um, tell each individual reader on the building, here are my encryption keys that I've created. And when I when there is a card that is presented to you as a reader, if these keys in the card don't match the keys in the reader, simply don't read the card. Okay, so ignore the card if things don't match. Um, that's all fine and it's great stuff. However, we've eliminated that by simply uh, defaulting that whole process. So you don't need to have the software to tell the reader what is the encryption uh, code that we're going to use here. The uh, crypto system will automatically generate those encryption codes, if you will, and be able to communicate from the reader to the tags that are going to be used that ensure those um, those uh, encryption codes match correctly. If then after the set uh, setup is done, if someone uh, presents a tag that does not have the same encryption codes, simply ignore those codes. And to be able to clone these cards, the capability of cloning uh, by today's uh, technology is virtually impossible um, to be able to clone the numbers in those cards. So Simplifying the whole process, you don't have to use this software to program your readers. You don't have to use that software to upload also the uh, encryption codes into the tags individually. Uh, this is all done by Atrium automatically. So keeping it as simple as possible, what we're used to with the old, if you will, uh, weakened 125 kilohertz technology and bringing that same ease of use to the new technology which, presents, which prevents the card cloning. This is what we've done with the uh, crypto um, uh, platform, if you will. So no tedious programming. Uh, the credentials that you'll be receiving, once you present them to the reader, it will automatically uh, do all the job it needs to do to make sure that the encryption is uh, correctly uh, programmed into the tag along with the readers and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's no different than what we've done before. There's no learning curve. It's simple. It's fast. You just present the tag to the reader. It reads the tag and you've got yourself a solution that is secure and that is very easy to do. So that allows us to provide an end-to-end -end solution, secure solution, it's AES encryption that we use for this type of system. Uh, so in a nutshell, between um, the tag and the reader itself, so when you present the reader to the tag, the RF field, the, 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 the data that's uh, sent between the tag and the uh, receiver uh, is encrypted, as we see here on the screen. Uh, it's a 128-bit uh, AES encryption uh, protocol. And this is the same type of uh, advanced encryption, if you will, uh, the 128-bit AES, as what you do uh, when you go online, do online banking or purchasing uh, 
uh, from eBay or Amazon and so on and so forth. So when you put your credit card information or when you uh, uh, pay the bills online and that kind of stuff, what that connection that you're uh, establishing with the uh, provider, with the bank or the, um, the Amazon, if you will, uh, is encrypted at 128-bit AES. So this is the same type of encryption that we have between the tag and the reader itself. Now, uh, between the reader and back to the panel, uh, we use 256-bit AES. So we, since this is a hardwired, it's easier to be able to communicate and so on and so forth. Uh, so we double up. So 256-bit AES, uh, I'm not sure at today's level if this is still true, but uh, a few years ago, 256-bit AES encryption was also called military-grade encryption. So um, banking and online transactions at 128-bit, okay. And then for the um, military-type application, high security, uh, we're, uh, we're right there with 256-bit AES. So double the amount of the encryption uh, capability from the panel, uh, from the reader back to the panel. Now, the way the system works to simplify and uh, you know, the previous slide, no tedious programming requirements, so on and so forth. When you first connect or power up the control panel on site, the panel will generate a unique, authentic, a unique set of authentication keys. So automatically, when you connect the, uh, when you power up the control panel, uh, part of its process of booting up, if you will, it will generate these unique authentication keys. These keys will then be uploaded through the RS-45 bus between the reader and the panel. The, the authentication key that the controller has created, has generated, is uploaded to each reader on the system. Now these keys, once you present a tag to the reader, will then be uploaded into the tag, matching the encryption keys with the actual encryption process. Now this is all done automatically, and um, very secure, very easy, no need to reinvent the wheel. However, we have also allowed within the Atrium interface, whether it's the software or the web browser, if you do not, uh, if you prefer to have your own encryption keys, and if you're familiar with the uh, our, our competitions, uh, the solutions that offer these type of uh, uh, products, um, you, you have within the Atrium system the capability to input your own personalized encryption keys. We have that same type of interface available to you. However, you don't have to use it by default. You simply do what you typically do and you'll have all the security you want. If you'd rather not uh, use that, or if you want to periodically change your encryption keys and so on and so forth, um, we have that capability within the system. We do have the interface allowing you to be able to put in your own encryption keys if that's what you prefer to do. So you get the best of both worlds. Default settings, all the options are there, ready to go, and it's easy, it's quick startup and all that kind of stuff. If you prefer and to go down your own customized and highly secure type scenario, you're creating your own personalized encryption keys, we have the, that capability in the system too. We have the fields and the menus to be able for you to do those things. Um, so from the reader back to the panel, and then again, from the control panel on the network, back to the interface of the network itself, all the transactions that are being sent back and forth, the events that are, you're receiving in your interface, the, uh, if you're adding cards when you're logging in, all that information is encrypted at 256-bit AES. So high military-grade encryption by default in the system. So the end-to-end -end connection uh, and high security um, solution is as we see here on this uh, simple diagram. So between the web browser, if you're going through the web, you have the SSL, TLS, the uh, secure um, uh, connection. If you're using the software, that is already the case. It's a private secure connection through the software. So instead of the browser, you're using the software. Uh, so that connection back to the control panel, to your master controller, uh, is an AES 256-bit encryption process from the control panel back or out to the reader. Once again, that's RS-45, AES-256. And between the reader and the actual tags, when you present the reader to the tag, that's AES-128 encryption. 
So end to end, you have your AES encryption solution available to you. So what does this uh, provide? It's the easiest at this end-to-end uh, -end high security solution. You install the board just like you've always done and you inherit all the advanced uh, AES encryption features without having to program and customize and go through all sorts of different uh, um, softwares to be able to get your product going. So there's no card programmer or reader configuration card required. Uh, if you want, you can have that. It's a matter of uh, your choice, but by default, you don't have to. Uh, so simplifying the process. Uh, and the, uh, the unique authentication keys are generated per site. So the actual client where you're installing it, it's a unique key for that particular site. And that key is then uploaded into the, um, the tags that are presented to the, to the readers and so on and so forth. So the... Uh, the solution allows you to have a end-to-end -end, um, secure connection to the system. So that's the uh, technology behind the card clothing and the solution we provided. Um, I think it stands out as a simple solution to get all the bells and whistles that most people that are dealing with these card cloning issues uh, have to deal with. So uh, I think we have a good, uh, good product to stand on with that. Other things that we brought forward as part of the new product showcase, if you will, uh, system licenses. Um, these licenses uh, with the Atrium Crypto platform, you will be able to um, add different licenses to have different modules activated in your system. Now, our, this is our first. Uh, uh, this is the first time we delve into system licenses, and the first license that we've brought out uh, is the Floor Plan Manager. So. Whatever licenses that we will be providing in the future, uh, maybe, maybe for uh, badging software, uh, to print cards directly from the Atrium interface. Um, taking off the top of my head here, different options. We will have different licenses available to activate those options as we move forward with the development of these options. And now any of these options, currently we have one available. It's the floor plan manager, as we see. These options that we'll be bringing forward with a license scheme, if you will, uh, they'll be available to the dis distribution. Um, so at your local distributor, you can purchase a license and they'll have, it's a card as we see here. And these licenses will be activated through the system uh, to the crypto readers that you have on your system. Okay, so it's the um, floor plans and the licenses will be, um, compatible with the crypto platform moving forward, okay? As a matter of fact, uh, tomorrow, I'm not sure if it's tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon, check our website. The, if you haven't already in the webinars, uh, I will be doing a floor plan manager, uh, a quick webinar, 15, 20 minutes to show you how these floor plans, what they look like, how to get them activated and how to get uh, the floor plans to be live and interactive with your system. And the webinar will be lasting no more than 15, 20 minutes. So very simple, very easy. So join us tomorrow, please, and uh, we'll show you how that works. By the way, uh, another by the way here, the um, there will be an in, there is an incentive for tomorrow's uh, webinar, the floor plan webinar. Uh, and I once again, once you uh, click to the invitation, you can also there's another button on that invitation to uh, sign up for a form to be able to obtain a free um, floor plan license uh, for your future installs. And uh, this is worth several hundred dollars, by the way, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, a nice little uh, thank you to everybody that signs up uh, to join these webinars. Uh, and tomorrow will be our first uh, free giveaway for those webinars uh, with the floor plan manager here. So what is a floor plan manager? Uh, quick, uh, we'll see more tomorrow, but to give you a heads up here. So in the web interface of the uh, Atrium system, the crypto system, uh, we will be able to activate this floor plan license. And once that has been activated, we'll be able to import floor plans. So if we take a quick look here, there's uh, where my, my uh, mouse is hovering right now. Uh, you'll be able to import floor plans. Uh, the um, formats that we will be able to use uh, as floor plan formats, drawings, designs, if you will, are JPEG or PNG files. And they have a maximum uh, capacity of one megabyte a piece. So uh, this type of floor plan that we're seeing here, very simple, very straightforward. 
uh, get straight to the point type thing. Um, that is about a, um, I think it was a 200 kilobyte size file, and we have up to 100 megabyte, uh, 100, excuse me, one megabyte uh, capacity maximum. So you can have some very nice files uploaded into the uh, zip floor plan manager and be able to use that. Now, getting back to the actual floor plan, the, the size of the file and all that, what we're seeing here is I'm building a floor plan in this particular screen capture. I'm in the uh, configuration, if you will. And what we see here is a list of all the doors on my particular system. And what I've done is I've simply clicked on the icon representing this door, door two, if you will, clicked and dragged it onto the floor plan itself. So whatever doors that I have for this particular floor plan that are listed in my system over here, I can simply click and drag them onto the floor plan. Now you can, if you want, have multiple floor plans. So each floor plan will open a different tab. So you can have multiple floor plans in your system if you have a multi-tenant building, that kind of stuff. Uh, by all means, you can, you can have more than one floor plan in the system. Once your floor plan has been configured, um, what's the advantage? And you know, of course, it's a visual interface. So we're seeing the floor plan and any of the, um, as we're, um, the system is being, uh, cards are being read and doors are being opened and there's alarms going on, so on and so forth. Uh, you'll see all of this in real time on the actual floor plan itself. Uh, you'll be able to uh, left click on the actual door icon, the padlocks that we saw a moment ago that I'm pointing to right here on the, the smaller image and be able to click on that icon and lock or unlock the door, grant access, uh, reset the door. So you will have interaction with the system. If someone forgot their card, you simply click on the, um, they, want, they want to access the door, you want to let them in, you simply click on the door icon and grant access for that particular door. Uh, and you also will be able to have the same interaction uh, to be able to uh, unlock all the doors or lock all the doors and so on and so forth. So there is an all door button that will be available to you also for that. Um, so simply click and drag. Um, and I was mentioning the file uh, format are either JPEG or PNG. Those are the files that you're, the floor plan files that you'll be uploading into the system at a maximum of one megabyte a piece. And you can have multiple floor plans uh, uploaded into the system. So that's what we will be uh, giving away tomorrow for those that sign up and that fill in the form. Uh, you'll have this once you purchase your A22K, your crypto system, uh, you'll already have a license uh, available to you. Uh, other addition that we have put into the, um, the crypto uh, is the capability to upload uh, Broadcast, I think, is the best term that I, I've come up with. Uh, broadcast the firmware uh, into different modules in the system. So this screen capture shows us the firmware uh, manager full uh, menu, if you will. And what we're looking at here, if I were, once again, my mouse is hovering, the, um, the system will display all the different types of modules that you have uh, connected to your system. Modules such as the A22K controller, modules such as the um, uh, elevator, A22K EC, the elevator controller, uh, modules such as the K1 readers. They are um, over an RS-45 bus, so they're communicating back and forth with the panel. So each type of module that you have connected to your system, uh, you'll be able to upload the firmware file for that kind of module. And this is a, a container, a folder, if you will. Once the firmware has been uploaded, It'll automatically distribute that firmware to all the modules of that same particular type on your system. It'll do that automatically. When that has been completed, you will then, if you want, be able to install the firmware onto all the modules in one easy click. So once I have all the modules, uh, the firmware is uploaded, I can simply click on the module and up the uh, clip on the uh, firmware folder here and install the firmware for that all those modules in one easy click. If that is, um, there are two thought processes here that we can uh, bring into uh, play. Uh, this here is uploading the firmware and installing the firmware on all the modules of that type in one simple click. Uh, I want you to keep in mind that if you have, for example, 15 A22K controllers and you upload and in, uh, the firmware for the A22Ks and then install 
each controller in parallel will start the uh, firmware upgrade process. So they're all doing this at the same time. Now, what that means is it's possible, and it's uh, actually it's not only possible, it will happen at one point when the controller reboots to initialize this new firmware, that process, which will take maybe two or three minutes, every controller will do that. Probably do it pretty much at the same time. So these 15 controllers that I mentioned will now all the doors, so we have 30 doors that will be offline for a couple minutes. So if you're doing this in the middle of the day on a busy day, it's not a good idea. Uh, there's a different process that, you know, let's do it individually one at a time. Now, we haven't eliminated that process. We can, if we want, upload the firmware. And then as we see over here on the right hand side of the screen of this particular menu, you see each of your individual modules. So here I have my controllers and I have a couple K1 readers. And here's the other controller. So if I want, I can go to this particular module and upload the firmware for that particular reader. Once I'm done that one, I'll go to the next one, and so on and so forth. So if I click here, once the firmware is uploaded and say install, it installs to all the modules at one time. If it's overnight in the middle of the night and there's nobody in the building, fantastic, I'm saving time. I don't have to do them individually. I don't have to wait for each one. However, if I'm in the middle of the day, like I said, it, it might not be the best situation. So if I'm in the middle of the day, well, do them individually, minimize any downtime. If you want to speed up the time and spend less time on site to be able to do this upgrade, uh, go when the site is uh, slow and uh, quiet over in the evening, overnight, early morning before people come in, do your firmware upgrade all at once. So this has uh, been added to the uh, crypto uh, interface for the Atrium system. Uh, so concluding here, updates all modules at once, or if you prefer individually, so uh, whichever uh, school of thought that you have uh, we will accommodate both situations. Uh, it's faster than using the software. The software by default will do one at a time and it'll do it sequentially. Uh, this here with the uh, capability to broadcast and uh, install all the firmwares in one single process, uh, one simple click. Uh, there's the, uh, the advantage of the time consuming, uh, time saving, I should say. And it's uh, per module type. So module types, including the A22Ks, the panels themselves, uh, the A22K set as an expander, the elevator, A22K, uh, EC. Um, we have the, um, the AIOM, the, the input output module that we can add to the system. Uh, that will also be another module that will appear on the list here. So all the different types of modules will appear in your um, firmware manager um, interface. Uh, we've created kits, uh, finishing up with the crypto here. Then I have a couple more slides, some other products. Um, so these kits, uh, A22K1, uh, if you're familiar with Atrium, uh, provides, you know, there's a power, the, the, the uh, metal box, the housing, if you will, pre-installed in that housing is the power supply for the panel. So you don't need to purchase a uh, power supply to activate the board, to power the board. Uh, by the way, the board does also, the A22, whether it's the A22, uh, from day one of the, the Atrium system, we do provide lock output power, 12 volts, 750 milliamps. And that's still true with the A22K uh, crypto solution. So we have one here with two readers. Uh, there's 25 uh, credentials included. You have your master and programming cards, the uh, USB key for your software and uh, different documentation, along, of course, with the control panel itself. Now, we've uh, also acquired recently uh, just before uh, Christmas break, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, a uh, lock manufacturer called Rofu, uh, based out of Seattle, and um, they are now part of the CDVI group of uh, group of companies, and we're including uh, their most popular um, uh, product line uh, into our kits here. Those are the uh, the door strikes that we see here. So we will have available to you a kit including two brand new door strikes. Uh, along with uh, the other kit that does not have door strikes. And last but not least, of course, uh, if we're doing in and out readers, entry exits, uh, we provide two readers with the panel. So if you need more readers, you'll be able to, of course, uh, provide uh, and purchase the K1 reader individually. Uh, so that's uh, wrapping up the crypto solution. Uh, we've also uh, enhanced our product line by um, offering this new product. Uh, this is for long range. Um, 
uh, vehicle identification, so parking lot uh, gates uh, scenarios, um, hands-free type of scenario, uh, where the read range of these uh, readers are for the smaller, the mid-range reader, the A A6 U49, you'll have a 20-foot read range. So from the card uh, in itself uh, to the reader when you get to 20 feet, so when you're in your car, usually these cards, these tags, if you will, they're mounted inside the car on the windshield very often. Uh, so when you get to within 20 feet of the actual receiver itself, that's mounted uh, on a pole at the uh, the uh, the gate itself. Um, it'll read, your, it'll sense your card right away and give you uh, a quick read. Uh, if 20 feet is not enough, um, you also have a larger antenna uh, available to you that will increase the range up to 32 feet. In other words, 10 meters. So the A10. U49 instead of the A6. So the 6 for 6 meters, 10 for 10 meters, and the U49 for the actual product. So uh, these units are now available to you. Um, uh, as of today, you can purchase this uh, from uh, our distribution channels. Uh, the tags that go with that, uh, different flavors. I think the most common one uh, is the A2U48, uh, the CUHF uh, windshield uh, RFID tag. So that's the one I was telling you that uh, typically behind the, uh, the rear view mirror uh, at the top left of the uh, driver's uh, windshield side at the top uh, completely, that kind of stuff, depending on where the antenna is installed to be able to read these, uh, uh, these tags. Uh, if you prefer, if you're doing hands-free access um, with a door operator type thing, so within when I when get to within 20 feet of the door, automatically open the door so I can walk through that door. Uh, you have actually uh, some credit card size, your standard cl clamshell type uh, cards that are available to you uh, that are compatible with these uh, UHF readers. Um, another thing, uh, product is the, uh, the license plate tag. So uh, this one here, um, I uh, put that on the front uh, license plate, if you, hopefully, instead of to be able to identify your vehicle as you uh, approach the uh, receiver itself. And if you are using the, the cards, um, one of the things within the car, you could actually, this is a card holder, uh, as you see suction cups here mounted on your card. So when you're in the car, you simply, that tag will be red, the card will be red. Once I get out of the car, once I'm inside the parking, I need this to be able to access the other U4 Go uh, installations that we have within the building for the hands-free connection. Uh, I'll bring my car along with me. So uh, this is a new uh, product available to you uh, from CDVI. Um, in the uh, encryption world, and uh, we're seeing more and more of this, uh, our wireless solutions, the Radium uh, wireless technology, we've now brought forward um, AES-128 encryption between the actual transmitter. So when you push the button and the receiver um, sends signals to the receiver, that signal, that transaction is encrypted in AES-128 bits, uh, as, as we saw earlier, the same type of uh, encryption that we do for online transactions. So high security transactions preventing uh, signal cloning and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, wireless, uh, we have the uh, long range readers and here's the, um, the Rofu products, uh, three different products, and there are several other products available. Just, just wanted to highlight these three. Uh, I think they're uh, three uh, great solutions, the most popular solutions. Um, the cabinet, motorized cabinet lock, um, it's a 12 or 24 volt DC solution. Um, so you can power that with the panel. So if you want to, uh, medicine cabinets, that type of stuff, pharmacies, uh, file, uh, fo file folders, that kind of stuff. So uh, this little unit is a very nice little uh, uh, locking device. And there's also included in this unit a um, door contact, a magnetic contact. So you have the capability to monitor if the file uh, has been opened or not uh, with this. If the, uh, so monitoring if you have a forced uh, cabinet instead of a fourth door. So there is a door contact in, in included in this unit. Uh, if you're doing push bar solutions, uh, this, uh, to lock your door, this, I think, uh, what I was explaining, and I'm not, a, uh, I'm not up to speed as much as I uh, would like to be uh, regarding lock devices and the hardware and so on the hardware end of things. However, the few questions and the bit of information I have gathered 
uh, from Wes, um, our sales rep uh, based out of Seattle for Rofu. Um, this is the most popular one. The reason being uh, is this is a surface mount. You don't have to uh, uh, cut out um, any uh, the the metal frame on your door to be able to install this lock. So very easy, very convenient, uh, very quick install. Uh, this particular model, the 2490, has a half inch latch throw. So from your bar, uh, we also have a three quarter inch latch throw uh, available to you that is also surface mount. And if you have existing ones, we also have ones that you can uh, install that are not service mount. Um, the kits that I mentioned a bit earlier, the A22K kit, um, will include the kit DS. Uh, this is the, the 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 door strike that you'll have, and this is the 2400 series. But it's by far and uh, and large the uh, the most popular um, product that uh, Rofu has available. Uh, that is now available to us, uh, through, to you, uh, through us, um, as it's, it's a new CDVI company. Uh, this is the most popular one that accommodate, from what I was explained, easily 75% of all the typical uh, doors that in, in a uh, commercial install or a standard install. These lock uh, will uh, accommodate those type of doors. So the two face plates make a big, uh, uh, make it very uh, convenient for those type of insulations. So that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, if you need to have more information about that, you can contact me. But if you want to know the the real guru, uh, here's his contact information. He's based out of Seattle, uh, Wes. He's been in the industry for many, many years, both on the distribution and the manufacturer side. And he is now uh, part of our team here. So uh, more than happy to answer your questions, reach out to him. He's there to help you. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll call it today. Uh, that's it for today. Appreciate everybody being here and uh, please stay safe, uh, stay secure, and uh, we'll see you hopefully tomorrow. And uh, thanks and have a great day, everybody. Bye bye.